Cities are forever evolving. They recover from disasters. One positive from the recent pandemic is that we are reclaiming public spaces. People appreciate when they had to retreat, they became very isolated. Being in nature was very restorative for people and really reminded them of what they perhaps had been missing. Just like designing small spaces, we need a city that fits us, not us having to fit into the city. Okay. Architects and urban designers and landscape designers really have an obligation and an opportunity to reimagine the city and create places and spaces for the benefit of community. If we designed cities with the people involved and understood what they wanted, I think you'll find much happier cities. Only then can we make small footprint living possible and the city a happy place to live. The post-COVID city is going to have some interesting characteristics. People are liking their local area because they've lived in it for the last year, they've worked in it, and they've rediscovered community. That means the central city will suffer. People won't be coming in as much, and the energy that's built up over the last 30 years will be tested. Therefore, the challenge is, how do we reinvent, how do we adapt the central city for a post-COVID environment? Oh, that'll be our bread. Martin, I've just been talking about you. And this is one of the advantages of COVID. <laughs> one of the things that happened to us is that we were buying bread and the lady who makes the bread came in. She said, oh, well, I can deliver it to you. Those little gestures where people just got to know each other is, I think, what COVID gave us. It gave us this ability to get back in touch with local. That wasn't even staged. <laughs> what we've seen with COVID-19 is an increased appreciation of the need to be outdoors. People started to sit outdoors in parks, golf courses. They really started to reclaim our public spaces and have finally realised our shared human affinity with nature, which is really a biophilic tendency. I think what we're going to start to see is healthier building design that is better connected to outdoor spaces the need for buildings and homes to support outdoor use. They might start to be better connected to their park spaces, introduce balconies and shared communal outdoor spaces. I'd like to see that infrastructure investment and policies start to really increase the equitable access and distribution to those sorts of spaces, because it is a social infrastructure that is a public health um, asset. Melbourne Quarter is one of the most significant mixed-use developments in Melbourne's recent history. It is 50% complete at the moment. The Sky Park was the first significant public open space to open as part of that. It's a privately owned and operated but publicly accessible park that sits high above the street. And it's an example where we're going to start to see more and more of these contributions to our public open space network. Is there any design language that sort of reflects the story of the city here? The main thing we've done is really look at how people sort of inhabit the city. You could have a bookable meeting room, you've got USB, you've got wireless, you can basically work outdoors. We've tried to encourage biodiversity, so insects and birds. We've seen people meditating up here, we have events up here, a little bit of passive exercise, so it really operates as an all-round little pocket park for the city. What's critical with public open space is that it really needs to be delivered as a public thing and a private thing because what you're looking to do is have good quality public realm within 20 minutes walk. So that could mean every few hundred metres. So they operate at a sort of local and then a neighbourhood scale and then that bigger public civic scale like Market Street. Introducing our book, Never Too Small, Reimagining Small Space Living. From Melbourne to Madrid, Athens to Amsterdam, and Singapore to Sydney, we revisit some of our favourite designs while also sharing new homes and spaces not yet featured on our channel. Architectural images, detailed floor plans, and an extensive directory make this a rich resource for anyone looking to build, redesign, or reimagine their own small space. 
You'll discover ideas for reducing your footprint and living more sustainably without compromising on comfort or style. This is our celebration, our love letter to the visionaries and artists of small footprint design. Never Too Small Reimagining Small Space Living is now shipping internationally from nevertoosmall.com and would not be possible without our audience. We are forever grateful to everyone who has watched our videos and dedicate this book to you. COVID, for better or worse, has exacerbated the inequities that we are facing and the challenges that vulnerable populations face in our cities. And it is a major call to action. There's this conception that density has been increasing the number of infections around cities in the world, but it's not actually density, it's actually overcrowdedness and the inability to socially distance ourselves. It would be very different to live in a dense environment where we can control the sense of exposure and the physical exposure that we have with others. Our cities need to address the amount of demographic that is moving into the city and large living is an, an ideal solution for this. Density comes in many sizes as well, so there might be gentle infill, maybe adding the possibility of having a house instead of the garage, or maybe dividing a big house into three apartments where three families can live. The more we understand how with small spaces we can actually fulfill our needs and then that we can share other spaces with others and not necessarily just with our immediate circle, with our immediate family, but with others as well, then we can start adding to this idea of how do we live small in the same time that we maximize the spaces where we connect. Social connectedness, it's no longer the sherry on the cake. It's part of the core things that we need as human beings. I'm a big supporter of mixed tenure. I believe that that brings diversity and because of that, people are able to actually connect in different ways. People along the income spectrum can live in the same environment, in the same neighborhood. If you start separating neighborhoods by tenure or income, then it's gonna be a very homogenous neighborhood. This mix of tenures embraces the fact that you can start building roots and meaningful relationships with your neighbors because you're gonna be able to stay there no matter what. For me, the perfect city is the right balance in between connecting with humans, with art, with nature. When we understand what are our needs as individuals and then what are our needs as a social species, then I think that we are gonna start developing better spaces. Proximity to the city is really important because often these are the magnets that draw us in. So they often have all the sort of cultural offerings that we like. So whether it's recreation, sport, art galleries, cafe culture, restaurants and so forth. But our suburbs are also important. They are the elements which stitch us together because they're the communities in which we live. If we have to commute always outside of our own neighbourhood to access the requirements that we need as a community, then I think we're doing ourselves a disservice. You know, how do we start to reorganise our cities to provide all the requisite needs? Do we have sufficient parkland? Do we have proximity in terms of a walkable city? Are we able to start to create an environment which is safe as well? These are the directions that we certainly need to be considering given the growing population in our major cities. As Melbourne grew, you got these ring of almost villages that were on, in many cases connected by a rail line from the city going out. These have now become quite sought after housing areas. They, they've got a reasonable density, they're mixed use and they're well connected. In areas like Brunswick, just off the railway line, you get the Nightingale development, where communities are coming together and with architects designing and building their own housing. Within this inner group, you're going to get this increase in density. And that's, I think, a really positive thing. They're creating walkable communities, well connected to the central city, but with their own identity and neighbourhood and community. If you're going to design a good city, there are six characteristics uh, that you, you're going to find there. You want density, you want mixed use, you want good connectivity, you want a high quality public realm, which is the design the street and you design a good city, and you want local character, you want it to be of that place. It'll also have the ability over time to change, to adapt, 
And if you stop the, the growth boundary of the city, the city would be forced to do that. When I met Rob Adams in 2018, he shared his vision for the future of Melbourne. One where the city doesn't expand an inch beyond its current boundaries. He asked me to imagine the city like a bowl of soup, with lots of vibrant flavours, all distinct but perfectly balanced. What happens to that soup when you try to make it go further by adding water? You dilute it. Suddenly, it's not distinctive at all. It lacks character, it's bland and dull. I believe the best chance at happiness for those living in our cities is one that embraces small footprint thinking. One that challenges us to develop our city more sustainably and more inclusively. One that makes the most of all the lazy land while nurturing our unique identity and creating spaces where communities can thrive. I think one of the key ingredients for happiness of, for people who live in the city is that they feel included in that city. They feel that they are part of a community. You can step out your front door and you know people in the street. You can leave your keys at the local store if someone's coming to visit and you're going away for the weekend. That's what community is. And cities that enable you to do that are cities that people are happy in because they feel they're part of an identity which is their city or their neighbourhood. The COVID reset has enabled us to have bigger aspirations and blue sky thinking and start to think more cohesively and in a more deliberative way of how we design and what we need to design. It's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and, and saying that we need to start afresh. It's really about amplifying what is good about our cities and doing it more, doing it better, and then starting to revise and transform those elements which don't really quite work for us now. The perfect city for me looks like a green city, an inclusive city, a city where people can have a cultural exchange. As increasingly the cost of housing drives out lower socioeconomic residents, we really need to put a primacy on creating opportunities from people from a range of backgrounds to coexist and enjoy the unique benefits of living in exciting cities. We need a more sustainable city. We need a more equitable city. I'm reminded now because I have children of my own of that saying, it takes a village to raise a child. We need to live in a very dense manner, in almost village-like hubs. But on their doorstep is everything that they need. This is going to create a city where there is less divide. If we are truly going to tackle the enormous challenges our cities face, we need to think small. I found the one that this heart loves. Let the veil be torn. Save yourself no more. Let this love in me find a home.